Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you all for joining this first series of webinars dedicated to accordion craft. My name is uh, Florin Andre and I will be your host today. This uh, webinar is organized by Accordion Artisan, a non-profit community of craft masters, accordion repairers and passionate people eager to learn more about pre-read instruments. So before we get started, let's uh, take a few minutes to present ourselves. So moving from left to right, I will start. My name is Florin Andre and I'm part of the Accordion Artisan staff. I'm in charge with communication and social media, everything that uh, is related with promotion of events, starting of new projects, questions or feedback will be redirected to me. I'm also an accordion enthusiast interested in repairing when time allows. So let's move to Vilio that uh, had this idea in the first place and uh, will tell us more about himself. Hello everybody. Uh, as said, my name is Vilio Manneriokki and I am the person behind the idea to have it, having this webinar. And I'm very delighted that there has been demand for this kind of event and that we can now and in the future bring accordion enthusiasts together to learn more about this instrument. Uh, I see knowledge and free information mandatory asset to go forward in life. And in Finland, the education is free from the preschool to the university level. And so it should be worldwide. And Accordion Artisans aims to have as high quality events as possible, so everybody can learn something new. Uh, this uh, is the first uh, international Accordion Artisan meeting, and I give my great thanks to our team and our guests, and of course, all of you who are participating. And I can also tell something about my background. I've worked uh, with accordions full time now uh, 13 years. And I'm having a small accordion workshop in Southwest Finland, so North Europe. Uh, and I graduated as an accordion manufacturer artisan in 2008. And last year I graduated as a master of handcraft. And during these years, I have studied accordion manufacturer history in Finland. And I have been one of the authors of an accordion history book, which was published 2014. And in my work, uh, I have been given a lot of time to old accordions, especially from 1910s onwards. But some instruments I have fixed or restored also from uh, the 19th century. Uh, despite uh, the knowledge about the historical instruments, I'm also having uh, modern tools such as five axis milling machine to work with. So modern aspects of accordion manufacture is not unknown to me. So, uh, so with these words, let's go forward. Karsten. Hello, everybody. My name is Karsten Dresser. I live science more than 10 years in Switzerland. And I worked here for like 11 um, years. I'm a master of handcraft of accordion uh, building. Uh, my education I made in Klingenthal on a school. And then I continued with uh, education as master of handcraft. So I'm more than 20 years in the accordion business. I have here in Switzerland my own shop um, since more than four years. I have on my stock like 200 instruments of each kind, diatonic, piano and button instruments. And I repair also each kind of instrument. What about accordions, harmonica, schwitzerkli, folk music instruments. I have a I sell my instruments worldwide. If you want to have some nice instruments, you can ask. And that's all for me. And back to Flori. Thank you very much, uh, Karsten and Vilja. So let's move uh, forward. And uh, as uh, my colleague said, this is our first webinar and uh, which was a topic that uh, some of you requested over the online survey and uh, evoked interested on private chat sessions so how it works 
the title uh, will probably be, be uh, a more of a series of retopics because we are trying to give different perspective on the subject. So one is more academic based on studies from universities and renowned researchers and the second one is more practical, more hands-on uh, given by industry experts. Our agenda today will uh, start by introducing our speakers and then we'll de delve directly into the topics. Uh, each speaker will have uh, around 25 minutes to present and we'll have a Q&A section for about 10 or more minutes near the end. As a reminder, this session will be recorded and posted on our social media channels. We have uh, a live poll section which we use as a feedback from the community and the last slide will be referenced to our social media presence. So several best practices we like to announce. If you have questions during the presentation, please uh, post them into the chat. Uh, you can also raise your hand and then unmute yourself when called by the host. Uh, feel free to ask questions during the presentation. We will bring them into the QA section in the end. State your questions and the name of the speaker. The, I will pass after that the QA moderation to Vilio and Karst. It's time to introduce our guests. Uh, we'll start from left to right. We have James Scottingham, Professor Emeritus of Physics at Coe College, uh, United States Undergraduate Institution in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. In addition to uh, academic degrees, including a Master of Science in Mathematics and PhD in Theoretical Solid State Physics, his background includes a musical study in piano and composition. He is a Fellow of the Acoustical Society of America and served as chair of the ASA Technical Committee on Musical Acoustic from 1999 to 2005. In the 1990s, he began working with undergraduate students in musical acoustic research, and the research soon concentrated on the acoustic of free reed instruments. Uh, he and his uh, students have uh, presented uh, well over 100 papers at national and international acoustic meetings, and several of his acoustic research students have gone on to graduate study and professional careers in acoustics. Uh, a good introduction to, to the scope of his work uh, and uh, the work of others uh, we can fi uh, find in his article uh, in for, from 2011, which is called Acoustic of Free Read Instruments in Physics Today, which is available online uh, at physicstoday.sciencecitation.org. Good morning, Professor Cottingham. It's a pleasure to have you with us. So we will uh, pass to our next guest, is uh, Mr. Lorenzo Antonelli. He's a, ch a chairman and CEO of uh, Voci uh, Armonica Italy. Uh, Voci Armonica was founded in tw 2002 by Lorenzo Antonelli and uh, Giassandro Brezia, following the merger of two companies specialized in reed production, which are Antonelli founded in the 1935 and Salpa founded in 1946. Uh, Lorenzo Antonelli, after graduating and obtaining a master degree in business management, trained in the most advanced uh, organizational methods. In 2012, he launched a co comprehensive business uh, restyling plan to adapt the company to the current challenges based on the decision to ensure a product of uh, high quality that is 100% made in Italy. Uh, he has succeeded in taking the best specification of both craftsmanship and industry and then combining them in a creative uh, synthesis that uh, might be defined as XLS manufacturing. In 2020, he receives an award, Gentile de Fabriano, uh, for the Mark uh, Workshop section. In 221, he presented the new Blue Star Reed, conceived and designed by in 2013, that have been gradually created under his careful supervision in the last years, with the essential contribution, of course, of the employees of Voce Armonici. Good afternoon, Mr. Antonelli. We're so excited to have you. So, let's move on. And I will pass it to Professor Kattegam to speak uh, about uh, his topic. And uh, as a best practice, the slides will be controlled on my end. So I will wait for your request, Professor, to change the slides. All right. And this is the uh, first slide here. First, I'm glad to be here talking to this group. And this, this is uh, simply the title page uh, slide. And then on the left hand, there, there's a figure from the Physics Today article. I think for this group, I don't need to show you what an accordion read looks like, so I won't say too much about that. Uh, the middle curve there is, we will come up later as a result of some experiments. And uh, 
some of us already saw a preview of the right hand picture, which will be an animation of a simulation that we have tried. So we can go to the next slide. And this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's in order of, that I'm going to present, but also in kind of a logical order, I think. And that is, uh, it's about, uh, of course, how reads work and what can we learn and what would we like to know. And there are uh, a few different categories that perhaps overlap a little bit, but the, the first one will be a general topics of scientific interest. And that is, although I uh, began studying free read instruments, actually, uh, I began my study with study of the reed organ, which uh, the reed organ, the harmonium, harmonica, and of course the accordion and all the related instruments operate on the same principle. And uh, I would say in, in my research, perhaps the main emphasis has been on what you might call uh, the general scientific questions, rather than what you might think of as things that could be immediately applied to practical use. And uh, I've listed two, th two categories under that. And uh, one is sound production by the vibrating free read. Uh, that is, how is the sound actually made? And the other one was, is related, but not actually the same. And that is the physics of how the free read actually maintains its self-sustained oscillation. It's sort of intuitive that if you apply a pressure difference across the read, the read is going to be pushed in one direction. And it's kind of intuitive that the read is springy, so it will come back. But it, there's a whole balance of uh, things that need to be taken into account to make that a sustained and a steady oscillation, including uh, fluid dynamics and pressure and uh, interaction of the flowing air through the reed. And this is the first part. It says the basic explanation is simple, uh, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, detailed explanation, in particular, how, the, how you get self-sustained oscillation is more complicated. And the second part of the talk, we'll talk about some topics of, of possible practical interest. Um, one is reed chamber resonance, which I think almost anyone who deals with accordions know that that is important in many ways. And a uh, kind of related topic uh, to that is uh, pitch bending accordion. Uh, well, and then uh, something else of, of practical interest, which is important if you're going to uh, make a read, uh, are just how, how is it affected by the variation of parameters? There are many ways to make a read that will sound at a given pitch. But uh, how long do you want to make it? How thick? How big should the gaps be between the reed and the reed plate? How thick should re the reed plate be? And so on. And then in uh, the final part, I'll talk a little bit about what we've been working on recently, which are computational simulations. And uh, these have potential uh, for results in, in both of the previous categories. That is, in particular, uh, it might help us if the, the equations that involve uh, the physics of self-sustained oscillation uh, from the from above there in the, are are quite complicated, quite complicated, and they really require a, a computer simulation. There's no simple way with pencil and paper to uh, to solve them. So that's something we're working on right now. But if we have successful simulations, those would also be useful in doing what the engineers call a virtual prototyping. That is, you could make reads that were all identical except for one aspect, perhaps the, uh, let's say, the thickness of the reed plate or something like that, and compare, compare their performance. So with having said all that, I think we can move on and get the next slide. Well, the left-hand side repeats the picture. Uh, the, the middle part uh, shows a reed from a reed organ, uh, which is where, I, as I mentioned, I, I really started, I think, when, with the reed organ. And the right-hand side, which is animated to show off that we can do it, uh, is, is actually what I call a generic free read. It's the very simplest possible construction where the shape and uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, offset above the reed plate. I might mention one thing about the reed organ, which I don't think harmonica reeds look like that. I mean, they look in some ways, they look a lot like that. But one thing you can notice in the reed organ picture is there's a lot of space in the reed as it's just sitting there, um, which I think differs from a typical accordion reed. There's some, obviously there has to be some space or some airspace, 
But uh, that's something that makes the reed organ reeds actually uh, have, often have a problem with very slow attack or slower than desired attack. But I think maybe we can move on from here and, and get going with the, the first item on the or outline. So if we have the next slide. So here it is. And I said that the explanation was uh, very simple about how reeds work. Um, and uh, the reeds work because as they oscillate, if you think about what's happening, they, the airflow from the two sides of the reed is interrupted because at a certain point, the reed is almost, almost closes off the airflow. Not entirely, of course, but almost. And then this is a, uh, the uh, graph on the left is actually a graph uh, from a microphone located near an, a, an accordion reed, in fact, in this case, uh, as, it's, uh, as it's being played with, uh, it's uh, mounted on a laboratory wind chamber, but it's being played with uh, airflow, pressure and airflow. And you can see you have these big uh, sudden jumps, and the sudden jumps occur at, at places where the where the uh, where the reed opening goes from being open to suddenly, pretty suddenly, almost closed. So you have a uh, you have this kind of thing, and the interrupted airflow, in fact, is is the this is the easy answer to how the the reed produces sound. You have an airflow because of the pressure difference. And you interrupt the airflow periodically, and that, then that gives, produces a sound. It changes the pressure, and pressure waves become sound, and it goes from there. So that's a simple but a correct qualitative explanation of how the sound is produced. Now, that part of the explanation doesn't tell you exactly what sound is produced. That will depend on all the details, not only of the reed, but of the reed chamber and the instrument, and so on and so forth. The next slide, please. All right, this is the graph we saw before, which is uh, uh, calculated from a, a, a kind of a theoretical paper by Laurent Millot. Uh, and uh, this is typical, There's several, uh, several papers like this have been made with the theory predicting the, uh, the airflow. So you can see for this particular read, I think this is a harmonica read, you have sort of a two-part uh, uh, two design where, uh, one, one, uh, one, you have one peak that's higher and one peak that's lower and a gap in between them and a bigger gap uh, later on. And then these correspond to points where uh, the reed is above the reed plate and then passes through the reed plate. So you get a dip down in airflow. And then very often in this particular type of reed, it will be below the reed plate, but not for as long. So you have a, a smaller peak there and then it, it repeats. And the, these, uh, these models, there have been several that are similar, uh, different in detail. This is a very, fairly consistent result that people have got when they try to make a, a, a model, uh, sort of a theoretical model of, of how the read works. The weakness in these, I would say, and I've tried some myself, so it's a weakness that is uh, difficult to overcome, is that in these models, the read is not uh, modeled realistically. That is what's typically done is you estimate sort of what the what the open area is when the reed is open, and and how the air the basically the area varies. So of course then the amount of air that will flow through will vary, and you get this model, which uh, seems to agree pretty well with measurement. Maybe have the next slide. Oh, I forgot we had this. End. So in fact, can we measure the airflow? That and now thank you. That that is the next slide. Uh, and here is a, a picture of uh, some actual uh, experimental apparatus that, that I did with some of my students. And uh, this has uh, a half of an actual accordion, which was not, uh, at the time we got it, it was not in very good shape and perhaps not a great accordion, but it was uh, workable, mostly working. Um, and it's mounted here. This is actually the uh, the base reeds on this this part of the accordion. It's mounted here, and I labeled this plexiglass because otherwise it looks in the photo like it's open air. But the uh, this part of it is below the the accordion here is sealed, and down below is a wind chamber, and you can kind of see there's a big opening in the wind chamber here. And uh, since uh, this accordion operates uh, in like most, I guess, all accordions. Uh, uh, operates on both directions of airflow. We have an air supply that is, is reversible. So we were able to, to uh, play reeds in either direction. And also for the reeds that were facing, uh, uh, facing the, the, uh, 
the side that we can see here, uh, we, we uh, removed or displaced the, uh, the felt covering of the reed so that we could actually measure the reed vibration with the laser vibrometer. And uh, what we're interested in trying to measure the volume airflow through the accordion reed is a function of time. And that is how many cubic centimeters, let's say of air per second are passing through the reed. And the, uh, the, of course the graphs in theory thinks they should vary. In fact, just by intuition, it seems it would vary. And uh, so we had an apparatus like this. Next slide, please. This is part of the same apparatus, the uh, big pipe that went to the air supply. And we actually measure, we can measure airspeed at various points in the, in the pipe with an anemometer, a hot wire anemometer, which I won't try to explain now. Uh, but it was, and then by getting the, the profile of air across the pipe, we were able to get the, the average airflow. Of course, the reed is vibrating at a, it's typically a few hundred times per second. So it's impossible to have a device that instantaneously measure the flow of air you know, sec, uh, by, by, by very small time intervals. So we managed the, the airflow. And then by measuring also the pressure near the reed, uh, we can do some calculations, which are too long to go into here, and and uh, calculate, or at least an approximate calculation of the instantaneous volume airflow through the reed. And if we look at the next slide, I couldn't actually find the slide from this particular uh, measurement uh, to prepare this, but by an earlier measurement, which is slightly different, but uh, agrees with the result we had, uh, this is what, what we would get for the typical airflow. And you can see it kind of closely resembles uh, what we had before. But as I said, this is uh, interesting that we can do that and seems pretty accurate, or at least match reality closely, but uh, it doesn't really explain how the, how the read is working. It, it explains that uh, at least for, me, for modeling the airflow through the read, it, uh, these models work pretty well. But they still leave out what would the actually important part, especially for this topic today, is what the reed is doing. Not the measurements so much, but actually the, uh, the uh, theories. Okay, I think we're ready for the next slide. And uh, you notice we've, we've left that one before I talked, the first one was supposed to be about these scientific problems about how the reed actually works. And I haven't given a, a solution yet. And that may come down in the computational part. But anyway, we go to the topic of reed chamber resonance. Now, in this case, I'm going to quote from uh, Tom Tonnen, who is, his name will come up later again. Uh, and he is a, uh, I think he is actually an engineer by profession, but he also is an accordion maker and designer. And in, in this case, I'm not, I don't know too many more accordion makers that, that do this, but maybe some do. Maybe some in the audience also do this. He also is interested in theory of, of, in fact, the theory of what we were just talking about. How does the read actually work? Which is, a, a, as I said, it's a complicated uh, physical problem. But he also was interested in read cavity and resonance. And I quote his article up there from the International Concertina Association. Um, he was very interested in the read chamber resonance in particular, as uh, is known to uh, harmonica players, mouth organ harmonica players, and I think uh, instrument builders, that sometimes, especially for higher pitched reeds, you can get a, a, an effect of the wind chamber that is not desirable. Sometimes it's called choking. Because the, if, if the reed chamber, whatever instrument it is, will have a certain volume and have a certain natural resonance. And usually the reed chambers are relatively small and the reeds are compared to the reed chambers fairly big that the wind chamber resonance will typically be much greater than the natural frequency of the reed. And in those cases, there's not too much problem. So with higher pitch reeds though, that can be a problem, which we'll look at in a little bit. But getting back to Tom Tonlin's thoughts about reed cavity resonance, he says, of course, they're mounted over cavities that have little effect on the vibration of the reed itself. That is, they don't interfere with reed vibration. They may do contribute to tone quality and, and perhaps a little bit to frequency because the resonances of the reed and cavity are rarely, resonances between the reed and cavity are rarely encountered. 
but sometimes they can arguably affect the temper of the musical tone with improper design and such annoyances can be annoying to the builder. Uh, I can find out later, but I'm sure there are a number of builders listening to this. Uh, you can, any, of, any of the builders can tell me if they've ever been annoyed by that. And uh, on the other hand, but uh, Tom Tonnen had this idea that you could actually exploit the resonance to produce a pitch bend and other acoustic effects by intentionally designing the cavity for near resonance and providing a mechanism that permits the musician to engage resonance at will, which we'll see later on. But first, in the next slide, I think. Yes, the next slide. What we did was we actually, uh, we tried to uh, build, it's sort of like trying to build an instrument that won't play. We tried to see how badly a reed chamber resonance could interfere with the vibration of a reed. So we built this uh, reed chamber, uh, which I think when you, in the succeeding uh, pictures, you'll get an idea of what the dimensions are. A pretty big box, much bigger than any accordion reed chamber for sure, unless you had a gig super gigantic accordion with very large reeds. But uh, this box actually was used for a number of other purposes, but we, it was perfect for what we wanted to do. It has, you can see two holes drilled and there actually, I think there's at least, at least one more, maybe two more. I think one more that doesn't show. And you can see a bit of a pipe that's uh, out on the left there. So it, if now, if you look at the diagram on the right, you can think of this as a, a, a picture. And uh, this, would, this would be uh, what's called a Helmholtz resonator and it has its uh, volume, uh, typically like a, a glass uh, a bottle or something like that would have a, you can blow on it and you get a particular resonance. And actually the, although the way we used it's a little misleading because we didn't have the neck open, we had the neck closed and we left one of these holes open to make a Helmholtz resonator. But anyway, and you can calculate, and we even have, I think this is the only equation actually in this presentation that you'll see on the screen, but you can actually calculate the, uh, if you had an object like this shown in the diagram, you could actually calculate its resonant frequency. And now if you look at the next slide, uh, we can see what we actually did with it. So here it's the same box and you can see, you can't see all the holes because they're on all sides, of course, but, uh, this one is simply plugged up, not used. And here's the place where the reed is mounted. And we'll look at that in a minute in more detail. And there are other things attached. Of course, the air supply actually comes from the uh, large box here is a wind chamber, which is detected, detected to an air supply, which you can't see in the diagram. So the air, which again, could go in either direction. In this case, because we're mounting this reed organ reed as shown in the right-hand picture, on the outside, the natural way for that to operate would be for the air to flow, air is flowing in. So the wind, the air supply is basically pulling air through the reed into the box and out the, uh, and out the box. Now the resonance there, in fact, we're considering to calculate the frequency is in fact, the hole in the bottom of the box, which doesn't show in the picture. And the, you see a pipe at the top here and I'm sorry, it didn't picture, uh, the picture doesn't go a little higher because the pipe is in fact is sealed and you can vary the resonance of the wind chamber by just changing the length of the pipe by fairly small amounts. And what we did was we simply tried to uh, excite this reed by turning on the air. And of course it's a working reed and it doesn't take very much pressure in most cases to make it vibrate. In fact, we'll see in the next, uh, the graph on the next page. So next slide, please. All right, so I, this, this it takes a little bit of explanation because on the horizontal axis, it's the frequency of the reed chamber, which we could, we could calculate. And we also measured it a few times to make sure our calculations were right. You, you have the resonance. This, so this is just the frequency of the reed chamber, disregarding the presence of the vib vibration of the reed. And the vertical axis is the threshold pressure, basically how hard do you have to blow to make it sound. And you can see, the reed was it, it, the fundamental frequency of the reed. If you would just just to pluck it, is very close to 440 hertz. It probably in this case, probably in the 450s. Uh, and you can see if you if if the reed chamber resonance in this case actually matches the frequency of the reed, you have a minimum threshold pressure. That means it's very easy to make the reed sound. And in this case, if you move farther away, if the frequency of the reed chamber um, 
moves away substantially from from this uh, center frequency, then it becomes very hard for the reed to sound. And I think the reason there's not much data on the other side is because it, we couldn't get to the sound at all. And I'm not sure. Anyway, but you get a minimum here. It's actually less than this. Is, these are kilopascals, so it's less than 100 pascals in this center region. So very easy to sound. And gets more difficult, although in terms of pressure, probably not out of the range if this was some kind of accordion, not out of the range of pressure you might see in an actual accordion or other uh, free read instrument. All right, now can we look at the next slide? And I don't know if you remember, but... Uh, we have a similar picture, except things have been turned upside down, but also the, uh, in this case, the reed orientation is with the free end of the reed at the bottom. But it, it's so there, the, the relationship has changed. And it turned out this was a configuration that gives a, 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 our most, uh, a most dramatic example of what can happen. Uh, if the, if the, so the frequencies, uh, uh, frequency, it's the same reed, so it has the same vibrating frequency. And it's the same box, except with different orientation. And let's see, let's see what that does. If we look at the next slide. So here we have, in fact, with this orientation, it's very easy to make this read sound at uh, any of these frequencies that you see below. So even easier than it was with the other orientation. So in fact, uh, as you know, you don't really need to have a, a resonator attached to one of these reeds to make it sound. If it's small enough, you could just pick one up and blow on it, it will, it will sound. But at a certain frequency, right about here, the, uh, the natural frequency the reed wants to go is actually very similar, close to the frequency of the box. So here's 440 is about the frequency of the uh, box. And here it becomes at that particular frequency, the two things vibrate at the same frequency, but they're out of phase. So they tend to cancel each other out, which means that you have to actually blow this right at that frequency. You have to actually blow pretty hard to make it sound. And we have some, we had, had some, some cases that were more extreme. I don't have them documented on there. So you can almost make it impossible, not impossible in this case, I would say difficult in this case, difficult to sound. Uh, at, at, if, the, if the resonator, remember this is the frequency of the resonator. Uh, so if the resonator is at this particular frequency, it becomes difficult to, to sound. So you do get this kind of effect sometimes called choking. That uh, is, uh, I was told, in fact, after I talked to a few harmonica players, if you take an ordinary 10-hole diatonic harmonica, that the top note is often a little harder, not impossible, but harder to play than the others. And with my limited harmonica ability, I kind of verified that. So this is something that does happen. And of course, what you can do, actually, if, if this would be a, a problem in an actual instrument, is you can adjust the volume of the reed chamber. And the reed builders, and, or accordion builders, I should say, uh, I think you know this, that in some cases you, 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 can change the, you can change the frequency of the reed chamber by changing the volume, which is usually done by adding rather than subtracting. But basically, if you move the resonance of the reed chamber away from the resonance of the reed, then can uh, deal with that problem. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now we, we come to the topic of uh, pitch bending. And uh, this goes back to the work of Tom Tan, and we're going to look at his, at his patent. I think the lower figure shows his patent, but we'll see it in a larger form in a minute. And so basically, he tries to, he has a mechanical method of, <clears throat> acoustically coupling the reed to an air chamber that he presents an, an impedance mismatch to the reed. That is the reed and, the, and your air chamber don't quite match. And we have two resonators that are close together but don't match, then they tend to get together and compromise. And that's what we'll see in this design. So I think we'll just go to the next slide where we can look at a larger picture. Uh, we don't need to look at this one for too long. This is, these, the next two figures are from uh, Tom Tonlin's patent. And this, for part of the patent, he just made it a, a, a kind of schematic diagram of a typical uh, instrument interior. So you have the wall of the instrument is the, uh, the shaded part here. The two, where the two green arrows I put in are where the reeds are. And of course the airflow can flow through the reeds, uh, the pair of reeds in either direction. 
since this is an accordion. And so that's the basic design. So if we look at the next slide, we can see Tom Tonnen's addition. First of all, he has a mechanical structure. And I think for purposes of this talk, I'm not sure I could do it if I, unless I studied it for a while. This actually shows the mechanical device he showed where basically if you press the, uh, press the accordion button normally, it plays normally. So there's no, with no access to this extra, extra uh, pipe basically. And what the extra resonator is, I think you can follow it here. If you look at number 91 down in the lower right-hand corner, that points to an opening. And then if you follow that, kind of follow that tube structure, which winds back and forth up to uh, where the reed, where the reeds are, you can see basically you're like adding a, a, you're basically adding a pipe of a certain length to those reeds. And since if since the reed frequency doesn't quite match the pipe. Uh, it will really depend on how far the opening is. So in fact, uh, I think the way his, I'm pretty sure the way this, his device works is you can lower the pitch, you can lower, you can bend the pitch down and back up. And it, it does work because I have seen live a demonstration of what we'll see on the next slide. So if we could have the next slide. And before we start the audio, I'll talk about it a little bit. So this in fact is, uh, this is one of Tom Tonin's accordions, and it's being played by a professional musician, quite a distinguished one, who plays jazz on piano and accordion, and also writes Hollywood film scores and things like that. Uh, so he's he's going to, and this is a demonstration from a recording he made using the uh, the blues box, as it's called. The brand name is the blues box, but uh, <clears throat> so uh, so this is just an excerpt from. Uh, that he is, he is playing. And I think the, I think the, uh, I'm pretty sure the short audio clip, I think starts a little bit before the, the spectrogram, uh, spectrogram here. And of course the spectrogram shows what across, this is of course, this is a, a stationary picture in this case, but the lower axis is time. So this is over a certain time from this little excerpt uh, going from left to right of a, a few seconds. And these are frequencies. So this in fact shows one thing that of course is true of the harmonic or the harmonica, well the harmonica also, but the accordion is that the tone has lots of harmonics in it. It's a very rich tone in harmonics. And so the fundamental frequency I think is down here in the lowest yellow. And this also played with the, as part of a jazz combo. So a little, a little other background things from other instruments. And then you can see all the, multi, all the harmonics of this going up in, in this tone, especially it's really easy to see on the left here where you have, uh, a lot of evenly spaced bars is a, a long sustained note, which is looks like it's not being bent. And then as it changes pitches, these things will go up and down. And in particular, when you get to the second half here, uh, I think you'll see places where you can you can see the pitch bending here anyway. So it's easier to look at the higher harmonics because the frequencies are bigger, so you get bigger separation. But you can see things going up and down, but not just going up and down, but sliding and bending and things like that. So now, if uh, Florin will play the audio. About to, now we're on the now we're on the diagram. Right about the middle of the diagram right now. So that was it, and I think uh, and uh, at uh, we actually had an acoustical society meeting where uh, <clears throat> where was, this was demonstrated by uh, Kenny Kotwitz and. Uh, well, I learned at that time that he actually likes to do the bends very subtly, but for, for purposes of demonstration, for us, he did them not subtly at all, so we couldn't miss the fact of his bending. But anyway, so it, it works, and uh, I didn't get a chance to put a reference up here, but uh, I think I'll try to provide a list of references to some of this that can be shared with, uh, with people uh, later on. But bluesbox.biz is the uh, website where you can find out about this accordion. And uh, they're still, they're, they're custom made, so they're not mass produced. 
But if you would like one built for you or discuss how to build it or discuss some other things, you might contact Tom Tonnen. Okay, well, I think we have one more topic. We're up to number three on the outline. So next slide, please. And I, this is actually starting number three. This is actually the uh, title page of a presentation that we gave at the most recent Acoustical Society meeting. And this is where we've been trying to do these computational simulations. There's a software designed really, I think, for engineers um, called COMSOL, C-O-M-S-O-L. And uh, what, basically the idea of this is you build your model. So if you wanted to model a read, you would construct virtually on your computer, a model of the read, including the materials, the dimensions, and all the, all the kinds of things that make up the physical read. And it sounds simple when you just say it. it's a little more complicated to execute it. Then you put in all the physics that you want, and uh, then you let it run. And uh, I think at least a couple of these pictures, the ones on the left are just uh, kind of, they kind of look good. But the ones on the right actually will come up uh, later. In fact, I think this one down here is the one that some of us saw at the uh, beginning when we were testing the animations. So we go to the next slide. And one of the one of the things we would want to do with this slide, actually, to bring up Tom Tonnen again, as I said, he does theory also. So he tries to take in the physics and all of this kind of thing and predict things like where the minimum offset distance would be. Uh, and and one one that he also made, which seems like it would be an easy one to test in some ways, it is, would be the how this if the sounding frequency depends on the plate thickness. In fact, he predicts that it does. Uh, the difficulty with doing that experimentally is that uh, to really do it right experimentally, you would have to have a set of reads where they're absolutely identical in all aspects, except that the plate thickness was different. Uh, maybe you could do it with a detachable read, I don't know. But another way to do it, which might be simply if, if, if we are successful in our modeling, would be with virtual type prototyping. That is, if we had a model that would, uh, in, fact, in fact, approximate the read accurately enough and, in, and take all things into consideration, we should be able to test things like that just by rerunning the model. It's it takes a little, at least a little bit of machining or, or work to uh, actually build uh, two reads that are the same, except with a different plate. But uh, on, uh, in modeling, it's easy. You just do a click of the button on my, type in the numbers, and uh, then you have a different read where everything except one, one property is the same. So maybe we can go to the next slide now. All right. So this is a, a picture of a model. This is a non-animated version, I believe. But uh, what we want is a three-dimensional model of how the read works. And I think maybe we might just take a look at this. The picture looks kind of cool, but what's what's happening here? In this picture, the in the center, sort of orange color, you have the read plate. And then in, in the read plate is now a little bit yellow is the read tongue. So that's, that would actually be the uh, the free end of the read tongue at a certain point in vibration. And then the airflow is going as we look at it from top to bottom. So you can see the airflow is uh, color coded. It's going downward as we look at the picture. And the color represents the air speed. So in fact, we have several things that are color coded. One is the read plate, and one is the air, and one is the uh, and air, air the, the displacement of the read in uh, in meters. Well, it's fractions of meters. And one is the uh, the speed of the uh, the speed of the movement of the plate. So this would be a goal if we had something like this that would was taking into all into consideration all of the physics that we need to get it to work. Then we would have exactly what we want. So we could, for example, we could just vary the we could run it over and over again, varying the thickness of the read plate and find out does it actually change the frequency. But of course, in order to do that, you have to actually model the thing is sufficiently. So maybe go to the next slide. Oh, this one goes, this goes faster than it does on my computer. But anyway, I think you can get the idea. We're getting closer to actual read vibrations, which of course typically are at least near 100 or more plus times per second. But anyway, we can see this actually in a way looks pretty realistic. And in some ways it is. I think it has a lot of correct physics in it, except it was, it was easier to calculate because it's a two-dimensional model. That is, what you see on the flat screen is all there is. In other words, there's no third dimension. 
we're looking at, you can see, I think you can guess, we're looking uh, kind of sideways at the reed, but we can't see how how wide the reed is because it doesn't have any width. Or if you want to think of it the other way, it just doesn't have well, it doesn't have any width. It's either zero or infinite. So you can put in the right physics, and you get something that looks pretty good. I'm interested in how fast this runs on, the, on this. On this, um, but anyway, and a lot. I think a lot of the physics is incorrect. We put in, uh, uh, in particular, the fluid structure interaction and so on, and the airflow. And there might be more physics properties we could put into this one. But it has something in it is what I already mentioned is inherently wrong and won't give us a, a really good model. And that is the two dimensionality, because you see this nice picture of the airflow here. And uh, the air is always flowing from uh, top to bottom, but the amplitude varies. So you notice if you can look fast enough, when the reed moves above the reed plate, uh, when the reed moves above the reed plate, the the amplitude gets bigger. You get some yellow above the reed plate, and that's because the air you get a, a faster airflow rate when the reed is open there. And we might mention a couple of things. In, in order to model this, this uses what's called finite element modeling, where you divide the space, the air space in here, into small pieces, and then you make them all connect to each other so that it's continuous. And then you put all of the, all of the, all the physical properties into all of these pieces. And one modification was here, which made the computation much shorter, which explains, you might notice that, uh, that the, this is rounded here. And it's not so obvious as it's going so fast that the, uh, the reed itself is actually rounded at the tip because uh, otherwise uh, where, the, uh, where these sharp edges come in and close up, you get very, uh, you get big problems with mathematical calculations. So anyway, this one actually, this in some ways is a pretty good model. Uh, a couple of things are not right. It doesn't include absolutely all the physics we need, but by being two-dimensional, it's much faster to compute, but doesn't give you realistic results because they're actually, by experiment, we know that there more air comes out from the sides than from the, the from just between the, the reed tip and the, the end of the uh, reed plate opening. Okay, next slide, please. And this, uh, I might have showed this earlier, but I'm showing it now. This is this is what we were trying. This is what we would hope to have, okay? Where you could make an app, and it's possible in Comsol to make these things. So if we had the right model, we could make it into an app. And for the app, you would put in the dimensions and other characteristics of the read you would want, the pressure, and so on, and let it run. And this is something that could be used by uh, practically anyone who knew how to type the dimensions in. So that you can actually export these things to get. So this is what we would like to have, which we actually have some samples of it, but we don't have samples for a read that works correctly. So still work on it. All of this is still in progress, by the way. So we're, we're not done yet. So next slide, please. And this, I, I wish I'd improve this slide a little bit, a little bit hard to read, but I can see it pretty well on my laptop screen here. So what we did, this is uh, some examples of our best simulation so far which we think has a lot of uh, good, correct physical characteristics. One thing it does, it actually with these simulations, uh, if you don't have all the physics in, it's hard to keep the thing going. Very often you'll get the read will start vibrating and then stop. Uh, and here, what we have, I tried to explain, we have about, uh, I don't know, 10 or so uh, different cases where the everything is the same except the pressure. So at very low pressure, uh, the read starts and then tapers off and doesn't last for very long at all. And then as you increase the pressure right about here in the third case, I think this is like 300 pascals, then you get it gradually amplitude increasing as far as this is as far as the simulation went actually. And the higher pressure you get, the faster things move toward a, a steady state. And by the time you're out at the end of these lower ones, it's going in a steady state. I think that, uh, because we have so many things in this figure, the dimensions are not the same. So in fact, you do get a larger amplitude for higher pressure than you do for lower pressure. But, uh, and this, so we, this one seemed like a reasonably good model because uh, one thing we know from experiment is that uh, you might expect the frequency to go down slightly for this read that's not in the, in the resonator as the pressure increases. So maybe look at the next slide. Okay, actually, this is the one. This is the one that shows that the simulation, in many ways, seems very good. You have a, a transient response that seems similar. So we have a simulation and experiment. The ex 
By the way, the experiment was done with an actual accordion reed, which I believe had a has a frequency of about around 90 hertz, or 93 hertz, something like that. And they, so you have a nice you have a nice uh, similar excitation, and it labels off levels off to a, uh, a steady state. So this one were, seemed to seemed to work well in many ways. Uh, look at the next slide, please. Now, what we were interested in, in particular, is kind of a test of whether our model was working. Is we took uh, a, an actual accordion reed, and uh, I think uh, we, I should have formatted this better because you can't see the numbers on the bottom. But uh, we we basically uh, mounted it on a wind chamber, so it's not in an instrument or anything. Just and then we gradually increased the blowing pressure to see what would happen to the frequency. And it starts up here very close to essentially the same frequency, very close to the same frequency, which is called in the slide, it's called structural eigenfrequency. That just means the frequency you get if you took the read and plucked it and listen to it. And then as you increase the pressure, pressure it gets a bit lower and actually goes uh, pretty far down. I'm sorry, we don't see the numbers here, but it goes down in not like an octave or anything, but a few hertz. So probably a, maybe a, maybe as much by the time you get to the bottom, maybe as much as a... Uh, a half, uh, a half step, something like that. Now, I should mention that the normal play, this reed would normally be played. It was an instrument in the in the in the left hand part here. So when you get down to these lower pressures, you're getting something that's so extreme it probably would not be used in it, would not happen in an actual instrument. And then if you really blow it way too hard, uh, then it starts to go back up again. And this is something we've observed uh, for. For quite a while in in these these reads, that the, the frequency tends to go down as pressure increases, uh, but in in fact, if you really blow it hard, harder than any musical purpose, it might go back up. So we we're looking for this downward trend, and uh, the best we've done so far is that we uh, seem to not get the downward trend. So this is the actual read measurement, and this is the simulation measurement of frequency. So basically, we only detected a slight rise in frequency up here, and well below frequency here. The low frequency may be accounted for um, just by the fact that the, uh, the read may not even go at full frequency until it gets farther. So I think I think these were using the whole curve starting from zero, at, so those might be very, but this in particular, this is what we're not, not what we were looking at. This, we, we would hope that this might somehow match up with this. There are some, some possible problems in how this was calculated, which we can work on pretty soon, but uh, anyway, we, we don't quite have it yet. Uh, we have uh, close to the right uh, dependency uh, model, but not working yet. So next slide, please. Oh, here's the animation. And this is actually a nice 3D animation. So this shows this shows what's, what's possible, but in order to be possible, you have to put in the right physics and to make it possible in practical sense, you have to put it in the right physics and be able to calculate it in a reasonable time. And in my lab, we do not have access to supercomputers. So uh, that kind of limits our, uh, some of these simulations uh, take more than 24 hours just to get a, a few seconds or even a fraction of a second. So it's, uh, can be, but anyway, so this, this is basically where we're working on. So as it says here, the, the work on this is continuing. It is a nice, the simulation looks really good though, but. Uh, we're not there yet. Okay, next slide. I think that is the final one that has anything on it. And so thank you for your attention. And I would be open to questions. Thank you very much, Professor Cottingham. So I have already a ton of questions, but let's move uh, forward to our, uh, to our last topic. So uh, okay. let's continue with uh, Mr. Lorenzo Antonelli. We will do the same thing. Uh, with the slide control and Mr. Antonelli will, rec will request for uh, next slide. So, uh, Mr. Antonelli, uh, it's you now. Okay. Hello. Hello to everybody. Hello. 
Okay. Um, I am Lorenzo Antonelli. Uh, thanks uh, for inviting me uh, to Mr. Manierocchi and uh, Accordion Artisans. I'm happy to be here to share my experience in making reads. Uh, in the next slide, I will show you my experience, my direct experience in reads, uh, in uh, uh, making a very deep uh, reorganization of the Voce Harmonica. And this experience was uh, uh, made uh, in making order in the company, starting for organizational matter, but more in understanding what are reads what we are producing every day, our history, our roots. And then I can share in this half hour something that I made the title New Paradigms in Acoustic Quality. Why? Because I want to present all you something that I make new for myself, new from the past in which everything was uh, not so deep, better, not aware, because the craft sometimes is uh, uh, understanding what we do, but not, uh, is not, uh, not understanding. In the craft, we do what we do in the past. The good craft made realizing very good reads, but sometimes they don't understand why. And my, my work was to make awareness about everything we do. So, uh, making reads is making sounds. This is the meaning of this first slide. We uh, we craft metal, uh, cutting, grinding, uh, uh, assembling. Everything we do affects and determine change in sound. This is the first concept. The end product for us is not the read, the read, yes, but the sound, because reads are the sound principle of accordion. Next slide, please. So, if I have to answer what is a quality uh, read, first we have to specify that in the there is a historical uh, confusion about this. If uh, we go in the web and read uh, the, the things about the quality, the most common classification of reads divides into three groups, uh, cheap reads, medium quality reads, and high quality reads. Uh, uh, tipo a mano is middle quality, a mano is uh, uh, top quality. But this definition is, is only indicative and uh, is simplistic if we take this literally. Uh, above all, I think we have to consider behind the mind, mindsets the quality of the read itself, behind the classification. And uh, we start to say that if the read constitutes the sound principle of the harophone and the read quality necessarily concerns the sound generated. Therefore, we will consider the parameters of sounds as key criterion to deal with the quality of reads. Frequency, amplitude, duration, and timbre. We start with this definition. Next, please. So, for quality, in my experience, uh, I hear 
lot of time that read quality, the quality for reads is the, uh, in ne the negative uh, concept. So the absence of flows, such excessive air consumption, too long transient attack, or instability of the rounding tone, or the premature breakage of the tongues due to stress. This is not quality. This is, a, this is, is negative quality. Quality for me is something completely different. That is a presence of elements that qualify and distinguish the reeds for their overall acoustic value and their ex expressive potentials and not an absence of basic elements that simply enable them to work well, which should never be lacking, of course. Next, please. So we can say uh, the concept of uh, quality. And in my opinion, quality is a potential. Something that can be enhanced for, from uh, the reads. We can say uh, that the construction of uh, uh, one accordion or harmonicas is to enable, to enhance the sound potential from the reeds. Of course, if, the, if uh, the potential exists, if the potential is higher, so it's possible to enhance more. If the potential is low, of course, the, re the final results will be lower. So the higher potential of reeds, the more can be extracted for them. The quality of reeds can, can be therefore be identified in their acoustic potential. And in the next uh, slide, I, I try to explain this. What is this potential? So, uh, the characteristic, the features of acoustic quality for it are four. But before exposing this, uh, this, this four elements, I think that is necessary to speak about skills and methods. The concept is, if there is not in the in one company, something that is a, a culture framework, technical level, structure of organization, and assets and resources that made possible the former. And for this organization, so methods and skill, because also quality, the quality system in a company is something that is organization. And then, I, this is the first characteristic of quality, one organization that make possible realizing quality. And uh, I, uh, there is a, a link uh, in, in, the, in the Voice Harmonica website in, the, in which I wrote one article some years ago because in the time in which I uh, reorganized, re reorganized the company, I, I made uh, uh, one historical uh, thought about my company, about our district of Castelfidardo, about the history of Ritz. And uh, I realized that uh, I realized that uh, uh, some ideas, some uh, evidence. I made an interview uh, to the old people, uh, old craft that produced uh, handmade reeds, and I understand this uh, uh, experience that I wrote in this article, and this explains a lot about reeds. 
And because uh, there was in the past something like uh, a, a time suspended in which the company in the decline of the accordions stopped to make researches, uh, stopped to, to invest in the company itself. And this explains a lot of things. And then in this article, I explain it, in my opinion, what happened and what should happen in the future. The, 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 the title of this article is The Reads of Tomorrow, because in, when I wrote this article, I was inside the reorganization, the company for the future. And uh, in this time, I understood what, in my opinion, are the characteristics of quality for reads and are raw materials, reliability and durability for reads, functional quality and acoustic quality. And in the next slide, I will explain the functional quality. Functional quality for musicians are usability, ductility, versatility, full and wide ranging possibility of execution with excellent performance in the various sound intensities and degrees. Responsibility, uh, very uh, response and uh, sensitivity, sensitivity in pianissimo with mi minimum air pressure and uh, also power and stability in fortissimo with high air pressure uh, regimes. Dynamic, that the ability to accompany the musicians in the steps between the various sound intensities. Dynamic is very important. From pianissimo to fortissimo and viceversa. The width of the dynamic range, I call dynamic range the uh, ability to minimize the physical intensity uh, frequency effects as the air pressure varies. And functional consistency, the presence of consistent relationship at the level of mechanical or physical response across the full range of notes, because reads are notes. And then it's very important that the musicians find something that link all the buttons of one accord. The reason I, I say like a, something like a stir with the same steps. This is something that attain the relation, the dimension of the each tones of the reeds for the different notes and half notes. Next, please. Acoustic. Acoustic is another possibility to see the quality. Of course, functional and acoustic, raw material, uh, reliability. In the end, all are in, involved each other. Everything in the final is one, but it's important to see the quality from two sides. Acoustic means the overall sound quality in the combination of its parameters. Uh, timber takes, in my opinion, the most important uh, part. Uh, timber is very <laughs> difficult to, uh, to determine, but if there is a good timber, is evident, is great. Is the most difficult things to realize because we have not the equalizer. <laughs> we have to work on the material. And uh, uh, if sounds is the body of music, timber is the body of sound. 
elusive subtle mimetic changing in the movement of the music timber is omnipresent and uh, is too long to explain how is important timber in the last century of music and is still very important is what is permit somebody to say this is very beautiful sound we are speaking about inside the sound this moment because we are in the one parameter of sound that is the timber the harmonic structure for that frequency sound quality in these terms is the most complex element to achieve the most elusive but is what best distinguish and qualify reads is the most important the most important element for its the beauty of sound can be associated with terms such as balance property definition luminosity vitality richness iridescence fullness fullness or warm is the color of the sound and also since the sound is generated through the material and for this is to happen, the timbric presence must be carefully manifested and enlightened. Its beauty can be associated with sensoriality. A new concept that of flavor suggests a deeper and broader qualification, immediate, expansive recognition and contact with deep and vital interior dimensions. This is what is, is the beauty. It's very difficult to define the beauty, but if the beauty there is, we can recognize it. The beauty of sound in its timber gives meaning and value to what we produce. It's the most coveted aim of our research and its most precious result. Timber quality for, uh, for the reeds and also a property of the harmonic structure for each note, it is for each pitch, and its overall timber coherence, a treat that binds the notes together like pearls through the, their extension. It's the same that functional, but this attain the color. The color. The proper, I mean that. For a bass uh, reed, the, the, the timber should be warm with a lot of harmonics low. For the highest frequency, the timber can be not so sharp, something warm in the high frequency. So it's something that is proper for each area of uh, the octaves. Uh, if the timber is uh, present and the consistency of the timber in the extension of notes is present, in my opinion, we can find excellence. Next slide, please. please. So, enhancing the acoustic potential is what is possible, which is the possibility to enhance the, this potential I spoke before. And for this, my experience is that uh, uh, from the sound principle of the aerophone, that start from reeds, then we can take this potential out. And the first, uh, the first, the main important uh, device is reed box and the, the chambers, the chambers, because in the chambers uh, we find the dynamics uh, of hair, pressure, speed, uh, quantity of air that goes inside. And then I made tests with my partners and customers, and we 
was is evident that more there is one adaptation of chambers to the reeds, more the results can be uh, this potential go 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 out in every parameters of sound. Every parameters, if the the amplitude is determined, but the, the other can be improved. That is the attack transient. That is the the intensity. That is the timbre. If the chamber fit the read, if the read have the potential, then the poten the the output go out. And then for this, I, I believe that reads and read blocks are an inseparable binomial for ensuring sound quality. Only if the ideal aerodynamics inside the shells of the read blocks are precisely identified and achieved, can be the full sound potential of the reads can be extracted and enhanced. In practical terms, this means regulating the air flow pressure and speed. And I think that uh, the secret of the very high level accordion of the past was in this uh, binomial. Good reads, very good read box. Uh, the, read, the read blocks must be adapted to the reeds and is a very big mistake to adapt the reeds to the read blocks. Doesn't work. Simply doesn't work. There is some compromises necessary, but most is the attention and the care to adapt the read, the read, the, read, the, the chamber of the read blocks to the reeds. More results are possible. Of course, this. Uh, there is a, a condition that the reads must be constant in their, para, in their own parameters. It's not possible to change reads for every batch. And this is a limit for, for in the past because in the past these parameters uh, was changing because the work was made from craft, from many craft that uh, are not the same in working the reeds. And my research, my, my, my effort was to standardize for the quality these parameters, fix the parameters and understanding what uh, is important for quality. The next piece, uh, enhancing the acoustic potential to tuning. Tuning, of course, is very, very important. They influence the, 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 the final uh, assessment. Tuning for as far the reads are concerned uh, is very important to don't produce negative quality because if we move the tongs, uh, we and the tongue is not well uh, fixed in the plate. Then they, we are, we we have the, the the instability of the frequency. Also, tuning is is important for because the tuning uh, touch the tongs profile. If the tongue profile have a very importance for the, not only for the, the, of course, for the frequency, but also for the timber. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote some ideas uh, about tremolos uh, that cover up, uh, so to speak, the color elements. There is a trend in which the, the tremolos are more flat in order to show the acoustic value of timber. Tuning 
is performed by removing material, as I said, uh, is very important in, in, for high quality reads, don't altering their profile. It's possible to touch up and down, but uh, the, the profile, modifying the profile mean modifying the, 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 the consistency of the color and the function, uh, the, quality, the acoustic and functional quality. The next, please. Uh, the reduction of the attack, transient, uh, in Italian we say impostatura, is the offset. Huh? We, of course, we prepare in the, in the, in the right uh, way, but of course, for preparing a good accordion is important to adapt to the player and, uh, and uh, to the read blocks and to accordions. Bulbs also are important for, for, for the, the, the color and for the effect, the final effect. Everything is important in an accordion, no? from, from the reads. Uh, 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 but everything affects more the, the acoustic results. The next, please. Uh, I wrote about a meme about the anti-corrosive protection that uh, is important. Uh, also, this is very important to protect the, 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 the reeds, the, the tongues. Uh, it's important, it must be, it's very important to, to don't touch the, the tongues. Less we touch, is better for this. And when there is uh, uh, the tuning, it's important to, to put the protection uh, in the tongs to preserve the functionality of, of the reeds. Uh, okay. The next, please. Like the, is the last, I, I think. The maintenance of reeds uh, is a very delicate matter. How long the reeds last is critically depend on the quality of their maintenance. In fact, the maintenance is performed correctly, can bring great benefits, but it, it can also cause a considerable amount of damage if performed incorrectly. I saw in, in my experience uh, some sets uh, of reeds, some reeds uh, completely damaged in, for the tuning. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy of this meeting because uh, it's one opportunity to be, uh, to share our experience in order to improve. Uh, to, to share uh, knowledge in order to improve for the improving of instruments and for the happiness of the musicians. Uh, the maintenance also is uh, intervention, the regular, uh, also is very important for the, for the life of the accordions. And, uh, and to, to finish, uh, I think that what I, I, I spoke about some, uh, some point that are general, but are the first step to awareness about the reads. And uh, I, I, I believe that this uh, uh, sharing, this uh, speaking in the supply chain is it can be very, very useful for the final results to the players. Thank you for your attention, and then I will be uh, at disposal for the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Antonelli, for uh, this insight. Uh, so uh, I will pass it to Karsten and Vilio for the questions. We have a lot of them. 
But before, I just want to ask you a question uh, to Professor Cottingen and uh, you, Mr. Antonelli, that is a more uh, uh, general question. Uh, so I will start uh, with uh, Professor Cottingham and after that you can answer. My question is the following. Do you consider that uh, a collaboration between, uh, let's say, research and uh, manufacturing will improve uh, uh, much the reed uh, uh, industry or the accordions? So you can start, uh, Professor Cottingham, on that. Thank you for, I, I was unable to unmute myself, but now that I'm unmuted. Uh, I, I think it can, it can be possible, and there are, <clears throat> there are uh, some people that do it, and some in, in, in just in general with musical instruments. Um, there are some uh, builders and so on of musical instruments, and uh, now I can start my video, come back in live, there I am. Um, there are some uh, builders of instruments and some, some musicians actually become interested in acoustical research because they're interested in helping what they do. And, uh, and also some, and it's just true of builders too, especially of course, probably more than any other instrument, the violin has been, has, has uh, been researched. And uh, there are uh, many, many people that actually build violins that are very interested in this research and other that have no interest in it. And I, th I think one reason I think one reason for uh, difficulty in collaboration perhaps is uh, how hard the problems are for doing research. I think this is the kind of thing that I was illustrating that we do is so simple. I, one of the I remark that uh, Mr. Antonelli made in his re really when he was talking about all of the things that you should need to do to make the reed chamber match the reed. Um, uh, which is, I think, a, a good point. But I was thinking of how difficult that would be to try to devise experimental setups to study that. And, and so I think there, there, can be, there can be collaboration and cooperation. And we have in the Acoustical Society, we have a, um, not a huge number, but a number of people that start as musicians that end up doing research on their own instrument. And they, they find that very useful, especially, especially musicians that are trying to design or improve the design of their, of their own instrument. So I think it's, it's possible if, uh, if both parties are interested in uh, that there, there can be co collaboration. But one reason that collaboration is difficult, I think, is because the problems are so hard. So, you know, exactly how should I design this reed chamber to make it match the reed? And I think that uh, it, in uh, something like that, unless it is you know, something very specific, it can be hard to frame that as a, as a uh, scientific study. Uh, so it's it's possible and some people do it and some, uh, some very fine instrument makers do do research sometimes, or at least are interested in research, and others don't, and both make all good instruments. So I'm not, I, mean, I think it's maybe it's, it's nice if it, if it works for the individuals involved, it works well, I think, but I don't know if it, uh, I think the, the scientific research doesn't have, uh, it, it, scientific research is almost too slow in, in some cases, because um, it wasn't until about uh, the early 20th century, I believe 1915 or so, that uh, the physicist Raman, the Indian physicist, sort of explained the motion of the bowed string, exactly what's happening. But as you know, string instruments were designed, really good ones were designed centuries before <laughs> before we had that, that sort of basic study. So that there's a, a lot, uh, there's so much that's done by tradition and, and just uh, experience that it's, it can be hard to keep up with that. But I think in certain limited ways, I think uh, some things can can be done. So it's possible. And it kind of takes a willingness on both parties to kind of match the interests of, of the others. Great, thank you, Professor Condigo. Well, Mr. Antonelli, what uh, is your thought on that? Oops, I believe he's muted. Yeah. Uh. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, I agree with uh, completely with uh, Professor Cuttingham, completely, because it's very difficult to to realize a research that involve different actors of the supply chain. The research will be today will be is necessary is necessary to break something that is conservative and is not right for the future of the economies. Yeah, is I have no idea in which we can create some incubator in uh, of this. Maybe is uh, this will can be a start in uh, Finland, uh, thanks to Vilio, <laughs> to make something together, involving the goodwill men or company. Sometimes the same. Who is who is open to invest sometimes with some other people that is involved? Uh, university, companies, the musicians. Uh, in my opinion, can be. Uh, we have to make uh, one uh, up, down uh, uh, behavior. So we can start from the musicians, some, and then. Uh, go down to solve some problems and solve simply some question. Some questions are some are easy to uh, to don't make make damages on the tongues hmm? or don't move the tongues from the ribbons. Very easy. Some questions are difficult, and then it's necessary to ask to the universities. To involve the, the research, to answer uh, some doubts that I have, I have the doubts about Ritz. Ritz are very complex. If I go in the physics or flow fluid or dynamics, I have not the resources to make the model. But if I have the collaboration with some producer of accordions of some for uh, service, and we are more people that focalizing some question is possible to make the plan for some years and then have some protocols uh, to follow to increase the final uh, product that is accordance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Antonelli. So I will uh, hand it to, to Karsten to continue with the question. So uh, go, go ahead, Karsten. And first, thank you, uh, Mr. Antonelli, Mr. Cuttingham, for your uh, time and that you explain what uh, about how working reads. Um, we have some questions. Um, maybe I start with a simple one. And Mr. Antonelli, Mr. Cuttingham, we would be pleased that well, it would be welcome for a short answer. Um, the first comes from Seba Mano and how we can how we can expect exact more song from the new reads. Um, I heard Mr. Antonelli, you have a new quality, new kind of reads. Like your blue star reads. Yeah. Yeah. What we can expect from this? Uh, I designed the blue star reads. In order to uh, to put uh, importance to the things that are important, for example, it's not important the blue edge for that identify the amano reeds. Uh, these are mindsets. It's impossible to identify equality from the edge of reeds. Of course, we know that if we recognize the blue edge, we know that these reeds are produced with the nastrino. The nastrino means in Italian, small strip. 
that was used in the past from artisans because it was more easy to cut the tongue from a small strip than the big strip. To, to, to produce tongues, to, 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 uh, to cut the steel, the high, lab, high, high uh, carbon, high, I, I, uh, is the, the steel of strips is uh, carbon steel with the 1% of carbon in the steel. And then it's not easy to cut. And then uh, without molds, without uh, machines, they, they, they made something, uh, the, the Italians, of course, because in Germany, uh, in, in the twenties, the level of technology was higher. Was one Italian um, history that there was in Italy some generation of craft, very, very clever, very creative that realized the Hamano reeds, the handmade reeds. But that was something in that time. But now uh, I, uh, there, uh, there is the possibility that to have one Hamano reeds with Nastrino that is only one, uh, something that is from Nastrino, but don't have the, 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 the features, the, the elements of quality. They can change. Uh, the, 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 the frequency, they can break, they can, are, they are not color or, or a, a color that is not good. So the words are important, but words are words. More important is the content. So what I made with the Amanorids, I, I, I try to, to, to take out what is not necessary for quality out, finished. And I gave importance, the most important, to the features that are important for quality in acoustic, in functional, in what I said before. So I think, in my opinion, this is, my, of course, I am involved in this. <laughs> and then I try to be more uh, detached uh, uh, from the, these reads. Uh, I tried to, to, to realize reads free from the condition uh, of this business and historic matters. So I concentrate myself to, to, to pay attention to the matter that constitutes quality. And then for this, I changed the name because I was, I want to be free from the past, of course, like tipa man or man, these, these words that are inside a, a mindset. Lustara, another name. <laughs> and then uh, in this, this case, I, prop, I will propose, I started to propose something that is, uh, uh, that is free from the conditional of the past. It's free from business, it's free from everything. Is, is the read, simple, read, to be, to be installed in the, in the accordion, in read plus, uh, is, is important for this that I start to, to propose this uh, only to the person and partners that uh, uh, giving the possibility to adapt the read blocks because uh, this is very important, very important. So the future of reads, I think that the future of REITs uh, involve the uh, organizational problem. Company that can invest in people, in good people, good level of technicians, uh, managers. And this is difficult because the company are small. This is it's a very small company. This is the, so for this is very important to involve, to involve the company in a good club in which we can do training, training in, in everything. This is important because the university can be involved to train the people that work in, the, in this small company. And this can be together. It's impossible that uh, one can resolve each other 
all the problems. I am lucky because I have a, the dimension of company that uh, can uh, allow me to invest, but also in this, but it's not a big company, of course, but also for this, uh, I work from nine here, <laughs> very, very hard to change the mindset inside and outside. But I yeah. trust that this work will, uh, uh, when I work directly on the REITs profile, myself, I designed this, I realized this, because, because it's difficult to change the mindset of people. They say, we're doing this same in the past. We don't want to change. Never, never. And then to change must be very strong energy. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank, thank you. Um, maybe one question for Mr. Cuttingham from Yannick Laridon. The airflow is all around the reed tongue, but in a 2D model, you only see the gap between the plate and the tip of the tongue. So uh, he was wondering if it could be possible to use a different gap then what is actually measured to have a similar amount of uh, air to flow? Or, or both? So the question is for both, but maybe it's the best question for Mr. Cunningham. Uh, well, the, uh, I think the, the answer is, I, I think it would probably, we probably could do that to get the volume airflow to be similar. But I'm not sure if that would help us because in uh, it might help a little bit, but I think it, it would still it would still not give an accurate picture of what the airflow is really doing, because the direction of the airflow is in fact not all in that direction. It's the direct the direction the direction of the airflow, which has been made, is really three dimensional. The airflow pattern. So it that might make things more realistic, but I, probably not realistic enough to model the total behavior but it's a good suggestion sorry <laughs> um maybe the next question comes from my colleague yeah thank you actually i have four questions from myself, and then there's lots of questions still in the line, but uh, I, I think we stop with this question and give to you, and perhaps the last questions me, we might uh, give you to answer later on. Uh, for example, make a small text or something. We can discuss that about later. But uh, uh, my question is very close to Akkola, Akkola Toria, uh, his question. He is... Uh, uh, asking about um, um, uh, like this maybe could elaborate more individually and separately on the aspects of length, width and thickness and my question would be why in the old times, let's say during the war time and nowadays, why the read dimensions are different uh, reeds were much smaller in that old time, and now they are much, much bigger uh, in length, and especially on the melody side. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Antonelli can answer to this one. Video, sorry, can you uh, repeat the, 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 the question uh, precisely? So uh, why is it that in the old times, Accordion reeds were smaller, and nowadays they are bigger. Yeah. So, what is the relationship between the dimensions? Yeah, the, I made one example very clear. The, I don't know why in the past was uh, smaller. Depends. In, for example, for the Italian and French uh, harmonicas, I saw the contrary sometimes for the low octaves. Uh, they was reduced for space needs, for reducing the, 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 the boxes sometimes. Uh, the most uh, a good example to understand for the people is the bandoneon 
example. In the Bandoneon, there are in the right and in the left hands one uh, octave equal, same octave, right and left. And they say the one is uh, very sad, the other one is very, very happy. <laughs> Why? Because where the reeds are happy are small, when they, they are sad, are very big. So it's possible, it's, there is the possibility, same octave, so same frequencies, is a trick in which is there is the possibility to modify the timbre, the color, working on the dimensions. This is very important. Is it something that can be used? Uh, in the diatonic, this is very important. And this is very important. Which is the best color? I don't know. I don't know. This is, this is uh, change with the time. Uh, maybe I, my opinion is that the best color and dimension is following something that is natural. So there is for the note uh, 440, for example, there are a lot of possibilities, bigger, smaller, and uh, thicker, thinner, but which is the best? I think the solution is something that is equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know in English the word, but something that fit that frequency without too much uh, alt, uh, cre creating the uh, effect like Bandoneon. The Bandoneon play, play use this effect of uh, uh, making this difference bigger is a one effect that was happy in uh, in the in the history of music for accordions for a uh, piano chromatic accordions for diatonic something can be changed but is the the result is the results can, can will be very interesting to discuss about this with musicians the musicians that are serious that are open to engage these matters and producer that we open to uh, make example what is uh, our weakness for a whole is don't speak each other this is a weakness uh, because more we speak each other, we made a table in which we can uh, share our experience, more the progress of and the improvement of the instruments will grow. I'm sure about this. I hope is, I, I made the answer correctly. Yeah, thank you. This, this was a very good one. Thank you. So, um, Florin. Yes. Yes. So uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of questions. So I don't think we can take them all. So uh, we will answer uh, the question offline. So sorry about that because we don't have uh, a lot of time. If you want to find us, we are uh, on the social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. So uh, if you have a project, if you have something that you want to share, don't hesitate to call us, to contact us. And uh, of course, uh, I want to thank one more time uh, to Professor Cottingham and to Mr. Antonelli for their participation and the uh, great information that they provided. Thank you very much. And uh, I will see you maybe next time. Enjoy the day. Thank you and uh, bye bye. Bye. Bye and thank you.